Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see y'all here this morning. If you would, let's stand and worship together. you be seated for a moment. I want to take a moment to just say thank you for being here. Glad you're here today. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We're so excited about uh, what God is doing in our hearts and in our minds, and I know he's calling up, raising up a generation of dads that are going to lead their children in faithfulness uh, to make the Lord the priority of their life. 
Um, and we've got a couple that are coming this morning. So Nick and Kaylin, if you come on up right now and bring your children with you. Now, they had originally intended to come and dedicate their children on Mother's Day, but illness prevented them from being here. And so we thought, well, what about Father's Day? That'd be a wonderful day, wouldn't it? Now, we don't make as big a deal. Amen. <laughs> we don't make as big a deal on Father's Day sometimes about the role of leading children to, to follow Christ and raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as much as we should. Uh, mothers tend to want to have all their family here on Mother's Day. Uh, dads sometimes just want to go fishing or be left alone. Um, but hey, we, I mean, we need to be intentional dads about nurturing our children and raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, uh, and so they've made that decision today. I want to ask you guys this question, and you tell me if this is your intention. Recognizing that your children are a gift from God and that he will hold you accountable to parenting your child, do you solemnly confess that it is your purpose to dedicate yourself and your child to the Lord and to his service? Yes. Yeah. All right. They do. All right. And so uh, the, the first child that they have is Elena, Rain. Owen, and so you can see the pictures there. Uh, parents are Nick and Kaylin, and grandparents, Shannon and Richard and Jamie and Miranda. I believe some of them are here with us this morning. Thank you. All of them are here this morning. Thank you all for being here to show your love and support for this family. And then Wesley, this is Wesley right here, Andrew Owen, same parents and grandparents. What a bundle of joy. All right, so here's the charge to the parents. Will you pray with your child and for your child? Instruct your child faithfully in the doctrines of the Christian faith and to teach your child to read the Word of God, to pray and to lead a holy life, and to commit to modeling that example for your child, to take your child faithfully to church services and to do all that is in your power to bring your child to the knowledge and faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You say we will. All right, church family, this is your charge to come alongside them. So would you stand with us now? This is your charge. Do you as members of Myrtle Grove Baptist Church promise to join these parents in teaching and training these children that they may be led in due time to trust in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and grow in their walk with him? And do you commit to continue to make children and families a priority of Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, to pray for them and encourage them in any way that you can, to continue to be a Christ-like example for these children? If you do, just say, we do. Amen. 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 We've committed ourselves to the Lord then that we might uh, see these children, number one, being raised in a, in a godly way, but number two, leading them to the to the faith and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now that's precious right there. I don't know if she's trying to put him in a headlock or hug him, but I think the kiss kind of sealed the deal. All right. All right. Well, let's pray for them together. Would you bow your head? Father God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you, dear Lord, for your love for them, Lord, that you've knitted them together in their mother's womb, that they're special and precious. And Lord, lead us as a church, Lord, to love them the way that you would have us love them to raise them in a way that is godly. Lord, give their parents grace and wisdom in this. And Father, as a church, that we would come alongside them and help them, that we would be there for them. And Father, that we would make Myrtle Grove Baptist Church a place that children are loved and cherished and can grow. And we pray this all in the precious, wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right, we've got a Bible for each of them. All right, good morning. We want to take this opportunity to welcome you here to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church today. Again, on Father's Day, it's a very special day. And again, we just are so glad that you've come and joined us in worship this morning. I was just informed that we do have a have an anniversary in our, our 
couple celebrating their 40th anniversary this morning. I don't know, Pat came and told me that. He went back to his seat. I'm trying to find Pat and Sharon right now. There y'all are right here in the middle. So, okay, congratulations on uh, 40 years this morning. So uh, just a couple of reminders for us this morning as well. We do have a children's camp coming up this week, and we're taking a, a busload plus again out to Camp Baldwin this week for children and leaders. I think it's, what, 70-ish or so? In that, in that neighborhood. So again, just be praying for our kids and for our leaders uh, this week as we go out there on Thursday and we'll return here on Sunday uh, morning for, for worship next week. So that'll be a good special service for us on next Sunday as well. Also coming up just here in the second week of July, July 8th through the 12th, of course, Vacation Bible School. And that's in the, we still do Bible school in the mornings from 8.30 to noon. And that's for uh, five-year-olds through completed fifth grade. Again, if uh, we are always needing volunteers and folks to help transport our kids around and serve in places like snacks and recreation and, and teaching and, and whatnot, again, there's a table out in the foyer, uh, out in the service. Uh, after the service, uh, you can go by there and see uh, Carol Larson, and she'll, she'll take your name as a volunteer if you want to register a child as well. Uh, there's some paper registration forms out there, and you can uh, and do that, or you can go online and register online if you'd rather do it that way as well. So again, uh, we're glad for your presence here today. Again, it is Father's Day today, as we, we've already heard, and I think Carol Sandy is here, and I'll let Carol Sandy and some of the kiddos uh, come down this way. Kiddos, I, I got that from Drew, I guess. Drew always calls the children kiddos, so I must have picked that up from Drew. Um, but that our dad, like I said, we want to honor our dads this morning, and um, well, we got plenty of kids here, and uh, we have a, a special gift, something that dads enjoy. I think most dads enjoy would be a, would be a, a donuts for dad today, and uh, so we're going to give our dads a ticket, and then after the after the service this morning, you can uh, redeem that ticket uh, for a donut out in our foyer from our guest services folks. So again, uh, we would just uh, again encourage. Um, our dads to, to stand up for us this morning so you can be recognized and that you can get your uh, get your ticket this morning for for your donut after the service so of course kids will have dads yes go ahead and give them a hand folks and that and uh, so uh, we'll have some kids up up in the balcony and some up here on the stage as well so again just uh, for that this morning and I I'll be honest with you guys, as I was driving back from Dunkin' Donuts this morning, the car smelled so good with donuts and that that I had to sample one on my way back, and they, and they were good and tasty, so uh, I won't get one after the service, though, so um, but I, I know we'll have plenty to go around. Again, dads, after you get your ticket, you can sit back down, and that'll help our, our children identify uh, who to give those to this morning. Um, just as we're, also, I neglected one announcement earlier that I'll make while we're doing this. Rondell Yeomans reminded me from our disaster relief ministry that uh, we uh, it's hurricane season. Of course, we're officially in that season right now, and we have some maps out in the foyer and uh, tracking maps, and also it has a good supply list for preparation, just as a reminder for us, so you can uh, pick these up in the foyer after the service as well. Richard, have you got something to share with us? Yeah, something he was saying. You got something for me. Ken to... Richmond sent me this morning about a stale star. Okay. Did you tell them? Okay, certainly. Thank you. Also, um, as you know, uh, many of you know uh, Miss Estelle Starr, uh, former member. Uh, she and her husband George were members here for several, several years, and she passed away recently. But her service will be Thursday, June 20th at Faith Chapel South with the visitation at 1030 and the service at 1130. So we do want to remember that. They were very faithful members of our church for many years as we as they finish that up we'll, we'll have a video that we're going to watch in just a second but i want just a, a little this form. is build a dad and he's pretty great build a dad is available in many shapes sizes and qualities and includes a variety pack of accessories you can build a business dad or a funny dad a handy dad or a where do you think you're going dad you can build a disappointed dad or a sad dad a friendly dad or a don't make me pull this car over dad build a superhero dad or a brainy dad a proud dad or a teaching my kid to drive dad build a short dad or a tall dad a hairy dad or a going bald dad build a tea party dad 
or a princess ballerina dad, a my daughter's first date dad, or a time for a lecture dad. Act now and we'll send you the attachable kung fu denture grip. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, that's not how it really works. Although, the Kung Fu Denture Grip would be kinda cool. Father's Day is a day to thank God for the unique, one-of-a-kind dad he created just for us. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, Dad. Build a Dad includes two bottles of non-toxic hair tonic for hair follicle encouragement. May not work depending on heredity and life stress. In some cases, hair tonic may not work at all, but God loves you just the way you are. Thanks, Dads. I tried the hair tonic and it doesn't work. <laughs> if y'all would, let's stand up and worship together. When peace like a river Shall be 
sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall It's 
me all my life. So, so good With every breath that I am made And I will sing Of the goodness of God church. Uh, my name is Neil Summerford. I'm one of the deacons here at the church. My privilege to pray with you this morning for our offering. So would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. Lord, thank you that we are able to come to your house to uh, gather together and worship you. Lord, just thank you for all the good things that you've done for us. Lord, we just pray now for these tithes and offerings that are taken this morning, that you would multiply them and bless them. Bless this church on this corner. Thank you for all the goodness that you've done for us over the years, and I know you'll continue to do that. Lord, help us now in, the, in these times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So many reasons to be thankful this morning. We have so many things to to give to the Lord and say to Him that He's worthy of them all. It's a wonderful passage there in Rome, in uh, Revelation chapter four, and um, the Bible says that the the golden bowl of incense uh, that's offered up represents the prayers of the saints. That's why we just sang day and night, night and day. Let incense rise. Because that's the prayers of the thankful people to God. I want to invite you now to open your Bible to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And we're going to go toward the end of the chapter there, beginning in verse 31. So if you have your Bible, Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. You've got your smartphone or your tablet. Go ahead and turn it on and open your Bible app to that passage. Um, so far... We've seen that the pathway of discipleship begins with seeking the Lord. It requires salvation in order for you to be a disciple. It will result in sanctification. And now we will see that before a Christian can move into maturity in Christ, they must pass through that step of surrender. Of surrender. Well, what do we mean by surrender? Well, that means being willing to abandon anything and everything that is not God's perfect will for your life. To lay it down and give it to Him. If sanctification is the process of removing dirt from your life, surrender is the process of removing fluff. Just the extra stuff that's not of God. That's what surrender is really all about. Surrender means realizing that Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. And what do I mean by all? I had a seminary professor that used to talk about the word all. And he said all means all. And that's all all means. Because a lot of people want to quantify all. All just means everything. Anything. Everything that God would say needs to be surrendered, needs to be abandoned, needs to be turned over to Him, it's His. Surrender says, not my will, but your will be done. 
Lord. And listen, if, if you're, you've not reached that point in your walk with Christ, let me tell you something. He's calling you to surrender today. He's, he's telling you that your life is not your own, that it belongs to Him. If He's bought it with the blood of Jesus. Now, the process of sanctification is the beginning of all of this, and it starts out with just saying, no, not that. You're not having that. That's sinful. And he's going to work on you, and he's going to begin to set you apart for his kingdom's work and for his glory by cleaning you up. But not only that, he's going to say, that doesn't belong in there, but this does. And as you decide to be willing and, and ready to allow Him to do that work in you, and He's going to say, okay, this one, this one is fit for my use. And that's what surrender is really about. So there's something in your life today that the Lord is telling you to surrender to Him. Each, each and every one of us. There's more and more of us that needs to be surrendered to Him each and every day. And I don't know what that is. But for Peter, in this passage, in Mark chapter 8, it was his idea of what the Messiah should be. And so if you've got your Bible open, let's, let's read in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. So stand with me, and we'll read together from God's Word. And he began to teach them, his, his disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul for Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray together. Father, we are so humbled beneath the weight of this passage. And Father, we understand that the Christian life is not a call to sit and to soak and to sour but it's a call to surrender and to serve and to sacrifice. Father, we pray that today we would be the ones that rise up and take our cross and follow after you in everything, Lord. May we surrender it all. And Lord, let us be reminded that you paid it all. And all to you we owe. And you are worthy of the glory. And to you, Belongs to all things. And that includes our very soul. Because we've been bought with the price that could never be paid on our own. The precious shed blood of Jesus. Our life for His. His life for ours. So today, Lord, if there's one here that's struggling with obedience to your call to surrender, Pray, Lord, that today would be the day that they say, Lord, you can have it all. Not just my eternity, but Lord, you can have everything that I am. It belongs to you. And Lord, if there's one here today that's never made that first step of trusting Jesus for salvation, I pray that they would do so today. And Lord, that you'd write their name down in your book. And Lord, that they would begin that journey of faith. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
I want to talk to you about surrender this morning. And I want to give you just three, three characteristics of surrender. And, uh, and you can just wipe that sweat off your brow and just say, oh, he's only got three today. This past week, I did seven points in 20 minutes. Can you believe that? Number one, surrender. It may be painful, but it's not permanent. I want you to hear that. I'm going to say it again. It may be painful, but the pain is not permanent. It's not a permanent. See, many people would teach that Christianity is not supposed to hurt us. In fact, we heard that even in our Sunday school class this morning. Someone said that they had read a, a line from the Episcopal Church. I think it was that was about how you could come to church just as you are. and No one's going to judge you because church is not supposed to be painful. And I thought, well, that contradicts my message this morning. Because Jesus says in the passage, if you're going to follow him, you need to take up your cross and follow him. And you tell me the cross is not painful? Jesus said that he would be killed. And then he mentions the cross. The Jews listening understood the Roman practice of crucifixion. Crucifixion was the worst form of punishment that the Romans could conceive. It took many forms. And all of them were equally horrific. From being impaled to being nailed in various different contortions upon a cross. In one mass crucifixion, the Romans crucified 6,000 slaves who rebelled during the Roman civil wars of the 1st and 2nd century B.C. The Romans would, would line the roads leading up to the cities, the major cities in the Roman provinces, with crucifixion victims, just as a warning against rebellious activity. These disciples understood that Jesus meant that Christianity would be painful. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who gave his life in a cause against uh, Nazi Germany, wrote these words in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. But here's the thing about all of this that we don't need to miss, that the disciples just seem to ignore or, or overlook or miss. This, look, at, look at the words again. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And then it was like right at that moment, their minds just couldn't take anymore and their ears turned off and they missed the next line. And after three days, rise again. The extraordinary thing that Jesus says is not that he will be killed, but three days later, he would be raised again. But the disciples missed it all. They didn't even remember it until after Jesus was raised from the dead and the angel reminded them of what Jesus said in Luke 24. The angel said to them, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how He told you while He was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And then verse 8 says, and they remembered his words. Like it finally clicked after Jesus was raised from the dead. And the thing that we had to understand is that though we suffer as Christians, and everyone who's a Christian, if you are a Christian, you will suffer. And it will be painful. And there will be things that the Lord removes from your life. And he says, this is not mine. This is not mine. This is not mine. And it's going to feel painful in that moment when you surrender to him fully. But you have to remember that that pain is not permanent. The only scars in heaven belong to Jesus. Can I say that again? 
The only scars in heaven belong to Jesus. His scars are permanent so that yours can be temporary. It doesn't matter what you face here on this earth, whatever you go through, if you are in Christ, your scars are only temporary. There's no emotional scars in heaven. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Amen. There's no physical scars in heaven. He will give us new glorified bodies. I say amen to that. I'm ready for that. I'm ready to upgrade to the new model. There's no spiritual scars in heaven because the curse is no more. There are no mental scars in heaven because the former things will be remembered no more. Amen. There's no scars in heaven. The pain that we suffer for Christ here in this life it's temporary. Now, Peter and the other disciples didn't get that, obviously. I think later on they understood it. Because history teaches us that many, if not all, of the disciples except for John were martyred for their faith. They willingly surrendered their very lives and really willingly surrendered to being tortured, to being burned, to being dismembered. For Jesus. But can I tell you what? The pain that they experienced. Is only temporary. I love what the scripture says in in the book of Acts. Whenever Stephen was being martyred. The Bible says that when Jesus ascended to the throne, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. You remember that? Somebody say, Amen, I remember that. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. When Stephen was stoned, Stephen said he saw the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus was standing in approval over Stephen's surrender. may be painful, but it's not permanent. It's because when Stephen closed his eyes, he opened them in the presence of his Savior. I want to tell you secondly about surrender. It may feel like loss. It's going to feel like loss, I should say. But it's truly gain. It's truly gain. Now look again what he says in verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It may feel like loss. I mean, when you take up your cross and you follow after him, it means... You have to lay down things that are not of Him. When you decide you're going to bend beneath the weight of the cross that He has designed for you, it means that you have to let go of your design for yourself. You can't be surrendered and be selfish at the same time. You can't be surrendered and be self-serving at the same time. You have to determine in your heart that the call of Christ is is higher and greater than any other thing. And that what He wants for you is exactly what you need from Him. So here's a question. I want you all to answer this question in your heart. Am I fully surrendered to Jesus? What does that look like? I've got three questions. What do I need to lay down? When I say, what do I need to lay down? It could be that these are laid down temporarily. But for the moment, for right now, it's not God's will for you. And for now, it may mean that I just need to wait longer. Maybe it's something that I want. Maybe you're a young person and you are looking for a spouse. And you have gone into a relationship with someone. And God is saying, no, that's not the person that I have for you. And he's calling you to lay it down. Or maybe you're in a career 
And God is saying, no, that's not what I have for you. And he wants you to lay that down so that you can take up another career. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a thing that you want. And you've just been honest with God. God, I really would like to have this house. I'd really like to have this car or this boat. And he says, no, I want you to lay it down. It doesn't mean that that's the permanent situation because he could tell you later on, okay, you, you've done well, you've been on the Dave Ramsey plan, you can go buy that now. He may tell you that one day. But he's saying, for now, I want you to lay that down. In Mark chapter 10, just a couple chapters later, Peter's still struggling with all of this stuff. Peter's struggling with surrender. And Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything to follow you what Peter said. I've, I've had to lay it all down, Jesus, to follow you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, Eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. You know what Peter's saying, what Jesus is saying to Peter? He said, Whatever you've laid down for me will be fully repaid. So what do I need to lay down? Secondly, what do I need to take up? You see, in, in, in order to take up your cross, it means to deny yourself. To, to put selfishness aside, to surrender to Him. But then at that moment, He calls you to a higher purpose. And He calls you to take up that cross that He has for you to bear. What do I need to take up? This is God's will for me that I have neglected or rejected up to this point. But now I realize what's best for me. And that He knows what's best for me. And I owe him total allegiance in all things. That's the cross that I have to bear. And some people will say, well, I'm a dad, and that's my cross that I have to bear. And I say, you know, that's not the cross he's called you to bear. The cross that he has for you to bear is his specific purpose for your life. Your surrendered purpose for your life. And if you haven't taken the time to pray and discern what that is for you, I challenge you to get into God's Word, to sit there surrendered and say, Lord, whatever it is, whatever you want for me, I will do it. I was trying to discern if God wanted me to be a pastor because I'm going to tell you what, I am an introverted person. I don't want to be up here in front of people talking and you might not think so, but that's only because the Lord has enabled me to do all of this. But can I tell you something? It was a difficult decision to lay down what I was doing in college, to lay down all my other plans and to say, I don't, I don't want to do all this. I mean, when I was a teenager, I had plans to be a Navy pilot. I wanted to fly an F-14 just like Maverick and land on aircraft carriers. I thought that would be the most awesome, amazing job. A little bit later on, yeah, amen. A little bit later on, I realized that that was not a likely career for me. That I mean, that only the, the best of the best, the elites, got to be Navy pilots. And I said, well, okay, well, I'll be an engineer then because they can make lots of money. And there's job security, you know, doing civil engineering or whatever. But as I was discerning, Lord, is this what you want me to do? I had to surrender to him, and I, I was doubting it all the way. And I opened up my Bible, and I said, Lord, speak to me about this. And I opened up my Bible to the Gospel of John, and the first words I read right off the page were, Stop doubting and believe. And I said, Well, Lord, if there was anything that you would have to say to me, that was it. <laughs> Get over yourself. Stop doubting what I can and will do through you. And just surrender. And so someone said, I didn't enter into the ministry. I surrendered to the ministry. And for some of you, 
It's not the ministry that he's called you to surrender to. But whatever avenue of obedience that he has for your life that he's telling you to take up as your cross, he's saying he wants you to surrender to that now. And realize that this is the best plan that anyone can have. Stop thinking that you know better. J.C. Ryle wrote, It costs something to be a true Christian. Let that never be forgotten. To be a mere nominal Christian and to go to church is a cheap and easy work. But to hear Christ's voice, follow Christ, believe in Christ, confess Christ, requires much self-denial. So the, the first question, what do you need to lay down? What do you need to take up, secondly? And then thirdly, what do you need to crucify? What needs to be out of your life for the rest of your life? What do you need to decide? This is not of Him. He spoke into my heart loud and clear. This is not His will. And I need to lay it down with total abandon. I know some people that they've wanted to be married and God hasn't allowed them to be married. And God's called them to singleness. And they had to crucify that desire to be married. I've known some people that wanted out of their marriage. And God has caused them to have to crucify that desire and stay devoted to their one purposed spouse. But here's the thing. In all of these things, whatever you have to lay down, whatever you have to take up, what do you, whatever you need to crucify, we're not talking about sinful behavior because sanctification is the process of the Lord removing that out of you. Surrender is the process of of you laying down anything good that's not of Him. See, the enemy of God's best for your life is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That's just simply not His will for you. And so at some point, you got to say, Lord, what you want is what's best for me. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And, and when you do that, it's going to feel like loss. But listen to what Paul had to say in Philippians 3. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul had his life lined up pretty well, I think. Jew of Jews, Pharisee of Pharisees, studied under Gamaliel. I mean, he was up and coming. He was the guy that, that, that gave the approval of Stephen Stoning. I mean, they were looking to him for approval and what they did. The Sanhedrin was looking to Paul for approval. And Paul says, everything in my life that I thought I had won, everything in my life that I thought was worth something, I put it in the lost column compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Paul says, the only place where I really win, the only place where I'm really gaining anything is being found in Christ. That's it. There's nothing else that's worth more than that. Can you say that today? Can you say, I can lay it down? I can take up His will for me and I can crucify anything that He has clearly said is not of Him. I can do that because I know the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. Can you say that today? In other words, can you say there's nothing in this world that's more valuable than Jesus? I remember the words of the old song. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. 
Just give me Jesus. I want to tell you the third point about surrender. You may be rejected by them, meaning the world, but you will be accepted by Him. Look at verse 38 again. And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road for the apostles. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, these are some tough words for Peter because he's he's basically saying to Peter, Peter, you're being ashamed of me right now. And he just said to Peter just a few moments ago, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He just called Peter Satan. That must have been tough for Peter to hear. But here's what it reveals. It reveals that Peter rebuked Jesus not because of his concern for Jesus' well-being. Not, not Jesus, I don't want you to suffer. But because a suffering Jesus didn't fit into his idea of who the Messiah would be. You know, this is our biggest problem with surrender. This is our biggest problem with taking up our cross. Because every one of us, if we're a God-fearing Christian and we come to church and we've been a Christian for very long at all, we would say, oh no, I'm surrendered to Jesus. But the problem is, we surrender to someone who is not the authentic Jesus of the scripture. We're surrendering to a figment of our imagination who we think Jesus is and what we think Jesus would do and what we think Jesus wants for us. You know, I'm convinced of this. We've got to sit we've got to stop sitting around trying to discern what Jesus would do and start doing what Jesus says. And start obeying him. Now, Peter, in Peter's mind, the Messiah, he's supposed to be a conquering warrior. He's supposed to bring about peace in a land that's full of turmoil. He's supposed to reestablish the nation of Israel. And Peter's going to be there on the throne with Jesus. He's going to be seated next to him. When he came in his glory. In fact, this is why when Jesus was raised from the dead, they're still sitting around and they're saying to Jesus, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Peter's problem was not that he was worried about Jesus. Peter's problem was that he was worried about himself. And what does that mean for me if my... If my Messiah gets crucified. And you can imagine the disappointment that the disciples were feeling in that moment. They had they, they built themselves up to thinking that they were going to be reigning with Jesus in the newly established, restored Jerusalem. And Jesus said, I'm going to die. You're all going to watch me die. Not a good look. Surrender means laying down your own pride, most of all. Surrender means humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. That at the right time, He will exalt you. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was too ashamed to be seen with Jesus in the daytime. And Jesus said to him, and this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See, if, you've, if you choose anything over Jesus, 
anything. You've proven that you don't truly know him. And what's at stake in all of this is what Jesus says, the most valuable thing that you have, that you own, that you possess. It's not a house. It's not a car. It's not gold. It's not a 401k. It's not a savings account. What is the most valuable thing that you possess? The most valuable thing that you possess is your very soul. And what's at stake is if you reject Jesus' call on your life, you demonstrate that you do not know Him. Because those who know Him and truly have trusted in Him believe that He is not only Savior, but He is Lord of all. And that means everything that I am belongs to Him. You know, if, you're, if you were being pursued by the authorities, hopefully that would never happen to anybody in here. But if the, I mean, if the cops were chasing you and they finally cornered you, in that moment, you don't commit. You don't negotiate. What do you do? You surrender. Hands up, don't you? An army that's been defeated can't negotiate on their terms. It must be full surrender. Have you come to the end of yourself? Have you surrendered completely? J.C. Ryle wrote, True Christianity will cost a man the favor of the world. He must be content to be thought ill by man if he pleases God. He must count it no strange thing to be mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, and even hated. So I ask that question again. Have you surrendered all to Jesus? Now, there's a moment in your life when you come to that point. If you've been walking with Christ, you come to that point where you say, He's calling me to lay it down. And, and when we say it, what do we mean? Everything. He's calling me to lay it all down for Him. In that moment, you prove whether you're His disciple or you're not. In that moment, you prove whether you know him or you don't. Because if he says, lay it down, and you say, no, I'd rather not, then he's not Lord of your life. And if he's not Lord of that aspect of your life, he's not Lord at all. And so here's the thing. Right now, here today, we, let's just do this. We, bow your head, close your eyes, so that you can focus on, so that you can focus on what he's saying to you right now. He's saying to you, I've had my finger on that spot. I've pointed it out before. And I've said it's time to surrender. Are you ready? Are you ready to surrender? right now are you ready to wave that flag that white flag and say I surrender Lord I surrender it all to you don't be surprised if you give that over to him that he comes back and he says here's this other place you need to surrender it may feel painful Can I tell you that pain's not permanent? It may feel like you're losing, but can I tell you when you give it up, you're actually winning the victory. You're saving your soul from your own selfish pride by surrendering to His Lordship over you.
And it may mean that the rest of the world says, are you crazy? But in that moment, he receives you as a child. Just say this to the Lord. Say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, you are worthy of all of me. And if today you've never come to Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, and you've never said to him, Jesus, I believe that you did go to that cross. On my, on my cross, you paid the debt that I owed. And Jesus, I believe that you were raised again on the third day. And I put my faith in you. Just say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that you paid the price for my sin on the cross. I believe that you were raised on the third day to prove that you are both Lord and Christ. So I give you my life right now. I surrender all to you. Save me a sinner. I pray. Thank you for saving me. Now I'll spend the rest of my life loving you and serving you in full surrender. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to have our our song of invitation, and this is your opportunity that if you prayed that prayer, for you to make it public so we can rejoice alongside you in what the Lord has done in your life. And we want to offer you baptism. We want to offer you resources so you can grow in a small group, Bible study, so that you can learn and serve and grow among the people of God. And so you come. If you've been drawn here by the voice of the Holy Spirit to join Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, this is your opportunity. You come as well. And if you simply need prayer, our altar counselors will be coming and you can just grab one of them to pray with and they'll be glad to, to lead you to the Lord in prayer. So let's sing together and you respond faithfully. Mean this with all your heart. Only sing it if you mean it. Don't to Jesus I surrender to him my free gift I will ever love and trust him in his presence Time. 